Hooray! We are live and we're having champagne or sparkling wine. So join us and I'm just going to put a comment in here. myself on Keith's. He's listening as he usually does next to me to make sure there aren't any issues. Okay. Hi Greer. Hi Keith. Hi Leslie. Welcome. Hi Greer. Top fan. Leslie, you may be a top fan sometime. <laughs> All right. Gordon Happy Mike Friday. Oh, Gordon, Gordon I'm next glad. to Greer drinking Glen Fittich. Oh, Gordon is next to Greer Mike. hanging out. Leslie, I don't Greer know if you ever met Greer. Greer. She's got a giant dog, Maggie. I've been looking forward to seeing you too, Leslie. I'm glad. Mutual admiration. All right. So, as people join, maybe it'll just be the few of us. Hi, Christine. Lisa. Welcome. Christine. You can see Christine. I don't see Christine. Christine oh, there she is. Keith got you before me, Christine. Welcome. All right. I think we ought to play a drinking game tonight. I think every time I say welcome, you guys should drink. Hi, Angela Ashe. Welcome to your first wine tasting wow. with Artisan Wine Group. I get all excited the, the first time I see people um, who have joined. And then remember, guys, and I'll say it a few more times, but if anybody joins, um, who you may be friends with or have invited, I might not be able to see their comments, so please go ahead and greet them. I miss you too, Christine. <laughs> so I'm gonna go. <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and um, open my champagne, and I always do this because people don't. Um, Susan. Yeah, Sue. Sue Lovecheck. You can. Nice to, to hop in and oh, join us. Yeah, issues. it's probably like only five there. Hi, Lori Bailey. Welcome. All right. I tonight, Keith and I are drinking um, Tétanger, and my French is awful. So, hi, Rosalie. I hope you found something to join us with. I'm glad to see that you are here. So, I'm drinking champagne tonight, and um, the way that you open it is you always keep pressure on it. Sometimes I forget with my ADD. You take off the, the wire cage that's holding it on. I'm regretting my choice a little bit. I mean, a quick choice. I like Tétanger, but I have so many champagnes that I love. So you tilt the bottle. <laughs> Keith just dove for the floor. <laughs> you tilt the bottle to the side, and you do not turn. You slowly turn the, the bottle. Sorry, I could feel the cork coming out. You slowly tour, um, turn the bottle. You don't turn the cork. You turn the bottle. Hmm. Hi, Marla. Welcome and, to, to uh, our wine tasting this evening. And... Here is my cork. It ought to look like yours. I always use a towel to cover the cork just to make sure that if it pops up, if there's a lot of CO2 at the top, that it doesn't go everywhere and that the cork does not um, pop out on its own. Oh, welcome, Anne, and welcome to your mom and to Chris Kubik. Um, yes, and that was smart of Keith to dive, absolutely. So tonight we are tasting champagne and sparkling wine. Whatever you have is what you're drinking. Some folks today reached out to me and said, hey, it's, it's the pandemic. I don't have any sparkling wine. And I said, you know what? Ch uh, Chardonnay is fine. You also could do Pinot Noir. They use that a lot. Chardonnay um, and seltzer? Chardonnay and seltzer. Please, no Chardonnay and seltzer. It will water it down. But, um, <laughs> but absolutely grab whatever you have. And if, no if nothing else fails, just have a glass of wine. Or as Keith and Gordon are having, have some whiskey or Ooh. scotch. Okay. Gordon's having scotch. I Gordon's not having scotch. Into the whiskey yet. All right. Tonight we're going to learn about champagne, and we're going to learn about sparkling wine, and we're going to learn about uh, what is the difference, or is there a difference, and how is it made? How can they possibly make this amazing um, wine? Um, and I will tell you guys that I spent the day, with, as did Keith, uh, with our oldest daughter in Boston all day. I think it was five and a half hours. Two different dentist appointments, root canals, uh, big deal. So. Um, I may be a little punch, uh, punchy tonight, and that's good too. <laughs> All right, I want to show you. This is my beautiful bottle of Ruinart. Comes from 
ruin our champagne in these beautiful boxes that open like this and they're just gorgeous and the reason that i share that with you is number one i spent um a, about a week in champagne this summer and um it was one of my favorite most amazing vacations ever i could have stayed there for a long time it's so beautiful and so elegant and these bottles are in the old style so um back in the 16 1700s when the french finally figured out how to make wine bottles that would contain the co2 and that wouldn't burst they put the they put um the the groove in the bottom and so these are kind of the old style and Ruinart still uses them and then this is the more traditional style so this is a sparkling wine from Oregon okay so hopefully you all have something that looks like that hi Mary welcome and by the way those of you who missed it we're playing a drinking game tonight every single time I say welcome feel free to take a sip of your champagne or sparkling wine okay and as always feel free to um, to ask any questions and to put in any comments that you feel necessary. And um, when people join, hopefully they'll feel like Norm when he walks into Cheers. Welcome. That's a drink for you guys. All right, we're looking at glasses now, okay, glasses. So glasses for champagne, long flutes, that, that's what we're used to, correct? Many of you can remember, and I don't own one, flat, the flat, um, one, the flat champagne flutes that we are used to sometimes people will have them on New Year's you don't see them often anymore because um, of the surface area so as the, as the bubbles come up you want to reduce the exposure to the air so that you keep more bubbles in the glass also the thinner the glass the more and, and taller the more of a train of bubbles that you will see believe it or not the dirtier your glass the more bubbles that you will have they have found that but the bubbles, um, the CO2 bubbles, stick to fiber. So if you wipe it with a napkin, for example, you may get more bubbles, okay? Did not know. This is another, you can see the, the long, the long um, length of it. Now this is a tulip glass. And I took this home from Australia when I visited Chandon, and it may or may not have been sanctioned. But I wanted to show you all this because when we were in Champagne, this is all they served. They were a little bit longer, but they used this beautiful tulip glass. And then the last few tastings I've been showing you, I've been drinking and using these tulip glasses. This is what is up and coming. You know this because it happens in France, where the rest of the world is soon to follow in terms of the wine world. And so, um, so I just wanted to share that with you. So it still has a long surface and you'll be able to see the bubble train, but it's not as thin as this is. Okay, so cheers. I'm going to go ahead and pour. When you pour, you always tip to the side because you want to preserve your bubbles. Champagne and sparkling wine are all about the bubbles. Hi, Tina Johnson. Welcome. Oh, Leslie, cheers to you. You're drinking a Chandon. So that's a double cheers. Cheers to Tina. We're playing a drinking game tonight. Tina, whenever I say welcome, you take a sip. And Leslie, cheers to you because she is drinking a Chandon, and my glass says Chandon on it from Chandon, Australia. <laughs> Since it's Siblings Day, Keith has reached out to my siblings to prompt them to join. Unfortunately, they're all West Coast, so there it's four o'clock there. Um, all right, so we're starting off tonight bringing people together. This is all about you. It's all about having a break from everything that's going on. And even though I keep talking, because that's what, it's a Facebook Live, great format for me, I want it to be interactive, as interactive as possible. So please comment, ask questions, and if I don't catch your, your, your question the first time, ask again, okay? So I'm Allison Miller from Artisan Wine Group, and um, we just, I just took you through how to open up a sparkling wine. Um, so cheers to everybody, thanks for joining. Oh, I forgot to pour Keith's. Yeah, I think you could do that. Quick pour, you get a lot of mousse on the top. Mousse? Yes. Mousse. What do you call the bubbles on the top? Mousse. <laughs> yes, the bubbles on the top are mousse, and um, the, um, the, the little bubbles are called, the, we call them in the wine world, effervescence. Effervescence, isn't that a beautiful, a beautiful term? So your pour, Keith, has lovely effervescence with a big mousse on top. 
Loose. <laughs> okay. Now, um, champagne. I'm really excited. As I told you, I, I was there this summer, but I was excited before then because I love sparkling wine. People used to save sparkling wine for New Year's, for toasts, uh, weddings, events. But actually, sparkling wine is made so um, is made for every occasion. It goes with. Someone said, "Well, what do I eat with it?" And I said, and, and, and my response was, "I really didn't say this, but I was thinking, what do you not eat with it? It goes with appetizers. It goes with the meal. It goes with um, dessert." And so depending on the kind of sparkling wine that you choose, it can go all through the meal. So whenever I serve, like even Thanksgiving dinner, I start with a sparkling wine, and if people like it, I continue to serve sparkling wine through. Now some people can't handle the bubbles, and that's okay too, and actually the friend that I traveled with to Champagne is not a bubbles person. But after experiencing the time there and doing the, um, and, and doing all the tours, she recognized she likes older wines. And the reason is she likes older, older um, champagnes because the older they get, the smaller the bubbles get. Okay, so Marla, Marla is excited because it is, it's a fancy evening. You are fancier than I am. Um, and I'm glad that you're enjoying it. And Greer asks, what's the difference between sparkling wine and champagne? Hi, Melissa, welcome. Everybody has to drink, cheers. Um, so, um, the difference between sparkling wine and champagne is really going to be our whole conversation tonight. Um, but I do have a quote that I wanted to read. All champagne is sparkling wine, but not all sparkling wine is champagne. So champagne is made in champagne. If it is in a specific way with specific grapes. If you have something that sparkles, that has effervescence, cheers Melissa, that has effervescence, it is a sparkling wine. So champagne is a sparkling wine, but it's just the region that it's from and how it's made. And I'm going to teach you how it's made tonight. Okay, so um, Mar Marla's got jeans and earrings on. I thought about wearing shorts with my, you know, business casual. Um, and Tina's in her PJs. That's awesome. And Leslie, you're right. Part of it is where it's from. Can you get a sparkling wine from champagne? They're going to use that real estate. Nobody asks that, but that's, uh, but they're going to use that real estate because it's so expensive to say it's from champagne. Okay, served. My champagne. champagne. What's that? How do you call it champagne? How do you call it champagne? No, I mean, you mean call it, call it champagne. Yes, what did I say? You said, they're, you, you just weren't clear. Okay. <laughs> All right, Keith is clarified. I'm not sure what I said, but he said, call it champagne. No, no, they're. <laughs> Sorry. All, right. <laughs> All right, cheers, Keith. <laughs> we made it through today. Shut up, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up, shut up. And I should probably cheers my friend who gave me uh, N95 masks today. Thank you. Cheers to you. Okay. So, Melissa, that's a great question. I'm going to get to that. So, um, the champagne is served at 45 to 48 degrees Fahrenheit. Mine's actually warm because it came out of my wine fridge. So, though it's, it was 54, I should have just stuck it in an ice bucket or in the refrigerator for a few minutes. It should be cold. And instead of having it sit out on your table, I would grab a champagne um, closer if you have one. These are the greatest things ever. This happens to be a Tétanger from one of the tastings I did with them. Closer, and then it just clamps right down and these work awesome. So those of you who won't drink a whole one in one night, which a lot of times I'd like to have a glass, this will, um, Keep the bubbles for at least three or four days so i highly recommend these i've had others that don't work as well but this one's good okay um and um let's see how long does it keep so an inexpensive champagne or sparkling wine can keep for three to five years um you for vintage champagnes 50 years plus okay all right so uh, Melissa asks, is champagne like a brand champagne is not a brand although corbell almost used it like a uh, vertical for a while, but people have stopped using champagne. Most countries have agreed with France that they will not use champagne on their label. There are U.S. companies who, before prior to 2006, when the agreement was signed, were using champagne on their labels, and so you will see champagne on some of their labels. They can still, they're still allowed to use it, but they have to say where it's from. So it would have to say champagne from Central Coast or Santa Barbara or whatever it is, and then it's not true champagne. It's sparkling wine, okay? So
So not the brand, but it does distinguish. And here's, here's why it's so important. It's made, it has to be made, you know the French, it has to be made by their laws. So it has to be picked a certain way. They can only grow in certain lots and it has to be made a certain way. And many of the chateaus and families there have been there for a long time and they um, have made wine for a long time. One of the places we visited, she showed us she still had vats from probably 20 years ago from her dad and her grandfather. And she uses, because they blend when they make champagne, she still uses some of her father's original wine in her sparkling, in her champagne. Okay, and they try to match the same percentage of grapes. All right, so Marla says, um, Marla kept hers cold. Greer has it in an ice bucket. Awesome. Um, Lisa, and that, oh, that's okay. Uh, that closer is cool. It is. Um, okay, all right. Great comments, guys. So difference between champagne and sparkling wine. Let's see if you can tell just by looking at yours, and you probably already know what you're drinking, okay? But take a look at your colors. Does that tell you just by the color if it's sparkling wine or champagne? Pause. Does it? It does not. Oh. It does not. Oh. <laughs> nice, Leslie. Leslie says she buys her Chandon by the case all the time. Leslie, remind me at the end to, to talk about the difference between Chandon and champagne because it's, it's interesting, okay, if I don't cover it. Um, so the color doesn't tell you. They're all, all sparkling wines will be some sort of yellow or pink. Um, it would be, could be yellow, it could be straw yellow, dark yellow, light yellow, okay? Now take a look at your bubbles. Are they big? Are they small? Are they medium? Okay, Marla sees a light yellow gold with a rose tint, interesting. And I, I know that's from the Pinot Noir that's in yours, Mar. Okay. I don't know if you can tell the difference between your bubbles and my bubbles. I can't see your bubbles, but my guess is that those of you drinking sparkling wine like Prosecco, you're going to have bigger bubbles. And if you notice, if you can see, I can see my bubbles on the screen. I don't know if you can. They're going to get bigger and bigger the more we drink them, but the more, the more it's open. Okay. <laughs> it sounds like I'm on something bigger and bigger the more you drink them. All right. Um, so Greer says she's going to Leslie's. Yes, we should all go to Leslie's for the Chandon. Um, and they make a nice rosé Chandon as well. So um, the bubbles are not going to tell you if it's a sparkling wine or if it's actually from Champagne or if it's a Prosecco. But I did say the Prosecco tend to be a little bit bigger bubbles. Okay. Now taste your sparkling wine, which many of you have done. <laughs> and Melissa has big bubbles. Lori, yours is very light with small bubbles, but you're drinking Prosecco. Okay, so that's interesting. All right, so that grape does tend to be a little bit smaller, but you can find, you can find tiny bubbles um, in, in Champagne as well. Okay, all right, and so tasting it won't necessarily tell you as, either. Prosecco tends to be a little sweeter. Champagne tends to be a little drier, the brute. And so when you go to Champagne, you are, um, you will be um, tasting mostly brute champagne, the dry, and you can go through their tasting flights and get sweeter ones. Welcome, Nancy. Cheers, everybody. We're drinking every time someone enters. Get your mind out of the gutter. <laughs> okay, so Mary asks, what does Prosecco mean? Prosecco is a type of wine that's made in Italy with Gavi grape, and I'm gonna talk about how that's made in just a little bit. Um, Tracy's got the Lamarca Prosecco. I use that a lot for blending, and that's a really nice Prosecco also just for sipping, okay? So cheers to everybody. All right, so we've tasted our wine. We can't necessarily how, tell how it tastes. There are tastes all over the, the spectrum, okay? And we'll get back to your taste. Why do we not swirl the wine? We do not swirl the wine because we wanna keep the bubbles and I don't want to spill, but we also don't swirl. We can smell it. What do you smell in your, in your champagne, or I'm sorry, in your sparkling wine? You can tell I like saying champagne and bubbles. What do you smell, Keith? Okay, you're gonna smell something different if you have a Prosecco versus a champagne. Pear. Or a sparkling wine. Pear, yeah, good, yep, pear. Greer has 
Greer method champagne. Does that mean you made that? <laughs> and Marla says, a Claude Monquiat and, and Cremant Burgundy. And as I'm a rosé, I'm a rose of Pinot Grigio. Oh, that's interesting. Yep. Nice to meet her. A sparkling, <laughs> an Italian sparkling Pinot Grigio. Uh, Lisa smells minerality, yep, and tastes minerality. And Marla smells rain and earth. Yes, that is that wet, those wet stones, okay? Um, and Melissa gets sweet, Greer gets earthy. Oh, and Greer says gru gruette, method champagne okay? Great. So those are all different tastes and qualities. Like when we did the red blend, you're going to get different things. Though typically the sparkling wines are going to have some minerality in them and the Prosecco will have some sort of sweetness. So we're gonna go back to the taste qualities, but I'm gonna to talk to you specifically about um, sparkling wine versus champagne, okay? So we already talked about champagne as a sparkling wine. A sparkling wine is anything that has bubbles rising from CO2, okay? Um, the difference is the region, as I said, in the way that it's made. So I'm going to tell you how champagne is made because I know you don't need to know all of it, but it makes sense as to why you're experiencing what you're experiencing. Okay. A bottle of champagne is made in a specific way in champagne. A bottle like Greer's, she has a brouette. And if yours is like this, where it says sparkling wine and it said, says method traditional, um, made in the traditional method. It may say, um, each country kind of says it differently. Um, method cap, um, there's a word I'm forgetting, but um, it would be something similar to method traditional. Marla's is from Burgundy. Hers is made in the traditional method. That means it's made just as champagne is made. So they press, they pick the grapes in champagne. You have to hand pick them. Other places around the world, you can use a machine to pick them you can press them. In champagne, you can only press them twice. You have to be very careful with the pressing. Other places around the world, they may not, well, if you're gonna say method traditional, you have to follow the rules a little bit, okay? So they're gonna take that, that wine or the, the um, fruit juice that comes from the grapes being pressed and they're going to, there's usually uh, natural yeast and they may introduce yeast, but they're gonna put them into steel tanks and they're going to undergo a fermentation. The yeast, transfers and it turns into, it, as it eats the sugar, it turns into CO2. So it's released. Usually they don't use pressurized tanks for the, the initial fermentation. That's called the first fermentation, the primary fermentation. Okay. Now what they're going to do next is they're going to, to, in champagne, put the wine after the first fermentation into the bottle and seal it. And the cool thing is they put a bottle cap on it. So when you walk through their cellars, there's like, it's, it's like a beer cap on it, okay? And then they lay it down and they, they have these boards that they use and they have to keep turning and turning and turning the, um, the wine. And that's because they've introduced, they also introduce sugar and yeast because yeast needs to eat sugar in order to create alcohol and the CO2. But anyway, the secondary fermentation occurs in the bottle. And as the yeast goes through its process, it starts to die. And when it dies, it becomes what they call lees, and it sits in the bottle. Well, that's part of what makes champagne so amazing and so toasty and smooth and gives it structure and beauty and elegance is the, is the amount of time it spends on the lees. And so as they tip the bottles, I should probably use one that's not, that's not open. As they slowly, every week, they have someone who comes in and hand turns the bottle. And that's to make sure that the wine is exposed to the lees the dead yeast, and that the dead yeast is heading towards the top of the bottle. Okay, everybody with me so far? Old Farm, all right. French La Vielle Ferme is Lisa's. I'm not sure what that means, made in the farm tradition. Lisa, can you do a translator for us? Oh, Greer says Old Farm, because Greer's from Canada, knows French. Um, and so Lisa's doesn't say exactly made in the bottle. That may be that it, do, it did ferment in the bottle and I'll cover the other ways, but it ultimately it's going to have aged on the leaves and the leaves will come up to the neck. They, it's cool, but they have this, they have this platform that they keep the bottles in and it, it, ultimately it, <laughs> it will come up to the neck. And then they take this brine solution, this frozen brine solution and they dip the neck 
and they take off the bottle cap and the top of the neck, which has all the leaves, the yeast spurts out. Yes, spurts out. Thank you for the, for the sound effects, Keith. And then immediately they add with a dosage, which is a little bit of wine from another, another um, batch and um, a little bit of sugar. And then they close it right up with the cork, okay? Now, an essential thing I, I didn't mention in that whole process is they always blend, okay? So it's corked, they're now aging it without the leaves. It's done, but it's aging. They will age it because it, it gets even more lovely as they age. But to go back, in Champagne, they can only use Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, or Mounier. And here's another tip for straight from France. <laughs> I kept saying Pinot Mounier, and every single guy kept saying Mounier, 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 um, with a French accent. And um, and so come to find out, they're trying to drop the Pinot part of Pinot Mounier. So that is a type of grape that is used in the blending of Champagne. If it says Blanc de Blanc, it's 100% Chardonnay. If it says Blanc de Noir, that means the Pinot Mounier and the Pinot Noir, the black grapes, are used in it, okay? And spring is not a technical term. Um, it is not a technical term. So, um, so that's basically how champagne is made. But thank, thanks, thanks for pointing that out, Mary. Um, you can also use Pinot Blanc, Pinot Gris, Arbane, and Petit Meliere in um, champagne, but um, they're usually used in very small quantities. And 90% um, of all champagnes use two thirds red and one third Chardonnay, which is pretty interesting. And what we found, there's two major cities in, in Champagne. One is Reims, which I never pronounce well. I used to think it was Reims, which is very much a city. Tétanger is there, Veuve is there, um, a lot of big houses, but it's, they're like right in the city. And then Epernay. And Epernay, they, they're known for primarily Chardonnay or primarily Pinot Noir driven grapes. The, one of the coolest things about the region of Champagne is during World War II, the Germans were only about a mile from Epernay um, and Brims. And so um, the, there are huge extensive wine caves where they would age these beautiful bottles of Chardonnay and um, people lived down there during the war. They didn't want to um, give in and they wanted to protect their, um, their stock, which was worth a lot of money. And so they lived down there for years. And when we were down underneath in the caves, um, it was it was extraordinary, and you could see how hard the the the, um, the grapevines had struggled because you can see them growing down into the caves. But there are miles and miles of caves, and there's an avenue de Champagne in Epernay, and all of the big houses are lined up along that. So there's Moet, um, there's um, Ru uh, not Ruinart, there's Perriette, Jouet, Jouet, anywhere you walk in. There's just incredible champagne and underneath miles and miles of caves. Yes, Keith? How long can, can grape roots get? I don't know the answer to that. You want to check it out? Sure. <laughs> Keith wants to know how long can grape uh, vines grow? Grape they, roots. Right, the roots. roots of grape vines. Yes, the roots of the grape vines. So he's going to check it out for me. Um, and Mary, the, the actual technical term for spurting is disgorgement. It is. Um, so... Um, just so you know, usually just in terms of timing, they age the champagne on the leaves for 15 minutes, months for non-vintage to three years for vintage. How, how old are these grapevines? I mean, how long do they typically live? That's a great question, Lisa. So in, Borde uh, in Bordeaux and saint Emilion, we were running around the grape, the vineyards, and they were 100-year-old vines. What happens is the older they get, the less um, grapes they grow, but often the quality is good, is really good with older vines. And so there's a, t a time at which they stop producing or they start producing good enough fruit to make fine wines. And so to give you an idea, it depends on the varietal, it depends on the location. 20-year-old um, vines are good, um, but 100-year-old vines, it depends. It depends how they're cared for. Um, some places, like I keep thinking Argentina on 100-year-old vines. Um, and a lot of the rootstock, too, in um, France was from the Romans. So they were hundreds of years. But then because of phylloxera, a lot of them had to be swapped out. So um, you see a lot of mix of old and new growths in the, in the grapevines. Um, so good question. Okay. Moving on, as you are 
tasting your wines and trying to figure out, well, okay, now I know how champagne's made. So those of you where it says method champenois, that's what you are having. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about rosé. So rosé champagne, they, um, they, they, um, when they, they leave the wine juice on the skins for a day, two days, a short while to get that pink, the, the Pinot Noir, the black skins to get a little bit of that color. I can't read that right now, honey. <laughs> Give us a simple answer. He's giving me the article on how long the grapevines can grow. So, um, so great question, Mar. Um, so Marla's asking, what are the for the for champagne? What are the um, what are the driest versus the um, non-dry? And so when we're talking about dry, we're talking about residual sugar. Most wine has maybe three, four, like fit vine wine, wine has like three grams of residual sugar, depending, a sh um, but like a regular red wine, um, a Cabernet Sauvignon might have four grams of resi residual sugar. And so extra brute, so they're, they're now making brute zero and Moet is trying to do a special thing where they say, you take ice cubes, pour the, the uh, zero over the ice cubes and that will be great. Um, Brut Zero has no added sugars. That's very dry. That's less than three grams of residual sugar. Extra Brut is less than six grams. Brut is less than 12 grams of residual sugar. Then there's Extra Dry, Sec, Demi Sec, and Dew. Okay, and Dew is very sweet, 50 grams of residual sugar. Okay, so some people might say, well, wait a minute. That's a lot. That's a lot, a lot, a lot of sugar. It's actually, it's not. It's not a lot of sugar. Um, and champagne contains fewer fewer calories than both red and white wines. Average red is 80 calories, white wine average 120. And the servings are genu generally smaller. So it's the healthier choice all around, even if you drink the whole bottle. So Mary asked, will my leftover sparkling wine last for, mimo for mimosa Easter morning? Yes, absolutely. Just like Leslie said, get a cap and it's fine. Um, Mary and I actually opened a sparkling Sauvignon Blanc months ago and I kept it for three weeks um, and with this cap on and it was still bubbly. So yes, Mayor, it will definitely last. Okay. Um, so a couple, a couple questions. Do bigger bubbles matter? Well, Melissa has big bubbles and I have small bubbles. Bigger bubbles are tastier. So the, um, if the bubbles are bigger, it increases the release of carbon di uh, dioxide into the air above the glass and enhances the release of aerosols. So the ar aromatic mixture and the release of the bubbles contributes to the distinctive smell and flavor. The bigger the pop, the more aromas. Okay. Melissa says it's sugar from the grapes. Is it sugar from the grapes? That's a great question. Um, so they can play with what's left. And then they can add additional, when they're capping it off, when they're doing the dosage, they can add additional sugar in. It's usually the sugar is, so they'll test what's in there and add from there. Most often it's added sugar, okay? Because the, the fermentation process uses a lot of the sugar. Marla said the whole bottle, drinks the whole bottle. Um, and Greer, again, top fan, bigger is better, kid. <laughs> Leslie does. And, um, and uh, all right, perfect. So does, the other next question, does champagne make you happy? You know, it makes me very happy, um, but there's actually a reason, and that's because it has magnesium, potassium, and zinc. So it really, really does make you happy. Do you get tipsy faster? Well, I, the answer to that is they haven't really proven either way. There have been studies both ways. The theory is that carbonation in your stomach aids the absorption of whatever you're eating and drinking more quickly. And so you may get tipsy faster, but then it wears off and it, it's equal to wine. Okay. Um, all right. So now we're going to go into how else might your wine have been made? All right. So if anybody isn't, I, we saw a couple Proseccos and we saw a bunch of champagnes that are, are not champagne, sparkling wines that are made in the method Champenois. Does anybody have anything different aside from that? All right, while you answer that, I'm gonna give you the different kinds of sparkling wine. Now, they're, they're becoming lots, okay? There are more and more. Sept, it's a German version of sparkling wine, and it can vary in dryness and sweetness, but it's typically less, um, 
less alcoholic than champagne. Okay. Prosecco. Tracy asked about this, as did others. So it's an Italian sparkling wine made from Glera grapes. And um, they typically have large bubbles and um, fruity aroma, making it common for mixed drinks like mimosas or bellini. So when we talked about when you mix with it, I always, if I'm making um, a uh, mimosa, I always use actually, I always use Prosecco. And I like Lamarca because it's much drier than a lot of Proseccos. Um, Proseccos can be sweet or they can be dry. And Lamarca tends to be a well-balanced, consistent product year after year. And opening the cava from Spain. And cava is typically made in the, um, the it's, it's, it actually has a similar flavor to champagne and it's typically made in the method champenois. Okay, so great. Cava is wonderful, great price point, and they've been making them really dry and um, with a lot of flavor. Okay, one question about glasses, a coupe glass. Thank you. Is a coupe glass the one that's that's wide? I can't remember the name of it, Lisa. But um, but the the rumor was that the coupe. I think that's what the coupe glass is. The the wide ones were were modeled after um, some. Uh, well, they said uh, Cleopatra's you know Marie Antoinette's breast, and that they took a mold and that's what it was made of. However, yes, okay, and so yes. However, they did find recent evidence that um, the coupe glass was actually around for a few hundred years before then. So it is in the shape of someone's breast, but it is not, uh, it is not Marie Antoinette and uh, they did not narrow down whose it was. But yes, so now every time you drink out of that, you can think of the mold of a breast. <laughs> um, and we don't use it as much because you can't see the bubbles rising and there's greater surface area. Okay, great question. All right. Um, all right, so here's how, okay, so we talked about Prosecco um, made with Glera and sometimes Bianchetta Trevig the Trevigiana, um, and it's often dry or very dry sparkling wine, okay? So Prosecco is made in a different style. It's called the Charmat style. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Lisa's not sure she appreciates it. Yeah, Lori also has a cava from Spain. I really, the price point on cava is very, very good, and the quality is excellent. Um, so while you two are tasting your cava, Anne and Lori, please describe to us what the taste qualities are if you feel like it, okay? So Prosecco is made in the tank method, it's called Charmat. So they take the juice, they <clears throat> do the primary fermentation in a steel tank, then they add the yeast and sugar and do a secondary fermentation in that same tank, okay? So it's the tank method, it's a cheaper way to do it. It doesn't, it's not as bold, it allows the fruit to come forward a little bit and a lot of wines will be made in that method, um, but Prosecco definitely is. And I, and I like your mom's idea. That was great, great. Okay, so then there's also the transfer method. Well, we were going through the different, there are different kinds. Um, so Proseccos can also be made in the Spumante method. I don't drink a lot of sweet wine, but um, Spumantes are fully sparkling and some are Frizzanti, which is slightly sparkling. Um, depending on the pressure in the carbon di uh, dioxide, okay? Um, and then the cava is, um, is made from the Macabo grapes. And um, again, similar to chain, two presses in like France. So usually when you get to the Carmat method, you don't have to do two presses, no. Because you're looking at other countries and it's, it's not regulated in that way. So in Italy, you can do one press, you can do two presses. It's not specific, it will depend on the winemaker. That's a great question, okay? And then French sparkling wine. So Marla who mentioned who she has the a- French rules? Who makes the French rules? The government. Um, the government? Yeah, it's a specific- It's not like a yeah. wine consortium or something like that? Or? It, so the old rules are the government rules, um, and now the wine consortium works with the government. So that's a really good question too. There's a lot of interplay, um, political interplay. Okay, um, and Tina says she agrees. Another big fan of cava. Yep, yep, absolutely. Um, and Greer actually, interestingly, is drinking one from New Mexico called Gruet, and it's made in Method Champenois. And that's a really, it's like a $15 one, 
but it's um, it is very much um, like a blanc de blanc. It's very um, dry and toasty um, with a little bit of pear. So that's um, that that would remind me of um, a champagne or a cava actually. All right, so French sparkling wines. So Marla's is from Burgundy. So sparkling wines can come from France and just not come from um, Champagne. They're a lot less expensive and they are called cremants. And most the, most times that they are made in the method Champenois and they can be sweet, they can be dry, they can be rosé. There's American sparkling wine like Argyle. Okay, this one is in Oregon. We couldn't get in their tasting room, it's packed all the time. I just ran to their store and grabbed a couple. They have very specific plots that they've picked out on the edge of the vineyards that they thought would make really good champagne. And so, or sparkling wine, they made this Brut Rosé. And people, I mean, there were lines of people, like they are just making some beautiful wine. And this one is 55% Pinot Noir, 40% Chardonnay, and 5% Meunier. Meunier. Um, so that would be made similarly. Okay, yeah. Leslie, that's how I think of spumante as well. Sweet, almost like soda. Yes, that's funny. Oh, and Marla's recommending hers <clears throat> from Burgundy. And in my business, I may end up um, carrying a cremant um, or two because they, they do make a good price point for good, really good grapes and good wine making. Okay, so back to the American sparkling wine, there are lots of different ways that they can make it. They can make it um, in the in the tanks. They can. Um, some people now are experimenting with doing the primary fermentation and halfway through it, bottling it, closing it up, and letting it finish the fermentation in the bottle. That allows the fruit to be forward too, um, and <clears throat> that is kind of they're they're trying it out. Well, it's it's how they used to make it, um, and they call that the ancestral method. Okay, and then there are a couple others that that other ways of making it. Um, but can you add carbonation, CO2, just right into wine? You can. It's just an inferior way of making it because if you're not allowing the fermentations and trapping the CO2, first of all, it's not, um, it's not great. And um, it's not authentic is the word I'm looking for. It's not like a good winemaking practice, but a really good winemaker um, from the States is trying to make better wine in that way because it's cheaper to make. It takes much less time, um, but for now, the best wines really are not made with carbonation, okay? All right, um, there's also Italy. Italy, we talked about, actually, um, there are South Africa. That's the classic that I was looking for. Um, Greer mentions that my Argyle looked, yes, it's okay. I personally, even when I was at Ruinart, I, um, this is one I got here, but I brought home the rosé. There's something about rosé that's that rose petal um, that I just really like the taste of. It's, it's, to me, it's a little bit of sweetness, but it's more aromatics, and it's, it just brings in a different taste quality. So my favorite are Blanc de Blanc because it's a very straightforward Chardonnay, toast, pear, um, and just the quality and the length that it stays on your palate are fantastic. And so it's great with everything. And the rosé as well um, adds another dimension to your taste. And that's when they are pressed on the skins or they macerate. They sit with the skins for, for a little bit, the juice. Okay. Um, does anybody have an Osti? <laughs> I know the answer to that because you guys have all been commenting. Nobody has an Osti. Osti is a muscat. And many of you, like Leslie, have had it in high school. I had it in high school. Many of you may have had it um, for New Year's one year. And um, that's made from Moscato Bianco. And it's sweet. Sweet, low in alcohol, often served as dessert. And that's made from a single tank fermentation. Um, and they add, they um, are, um, and they chill it. Okay, there's a whole lot of detail in it, but we won't go into that. Um, Oh, interesting. The cava has dry pear. Interesting. Yeah. Um, the Lambrusco, so Lamb comment if you've heard of Lambrusco. Um, I was at the Italian um, wine tasting, industry wine tasting, and um, they had they, they kept saying, you have to try the Lambrusco, you have to try the Lambrusco. Americans love Lambrusco. So we tried the Lambrusco and it was sweet. 
it was like a strawberry sweet, almost like soda. And I guess it's catching on in the United States. I was not a huge fan, but it has a gentle fizz. And again, what is good wine? Good wine is anything that you really like, that you enjoy. Um, so it's red, it's sparkling, and every region where Lambrusco is made, and you'll see this in the store now that we've talked about it, you'll see it. Um, each region has its own wine style. There's also things like Rosa Regale. People love that. That's from Italy. It's a pink sparkling wine. It's a little bit sweet. It's made from Brichetto. Um, then there's <clears throat> sparkling Syrah as well. So there's lots of sparkling ones um, that are made through the tank method. Okay. So Melissa says, I have the mark. I had it at a wedding. Yes. They serve it quite a bit. You'll see it all over the store now that you've seen it because it goes with everything. It can, you can start, and I was looking for a less expensive champagne because I really like the taste quality of champagne. And so <clears throat> I looked at the Cava's at the time and my go-to is typically Chandon, like what Leslie is drinking. If I can't find those, I will go to Lamarca. And I always have a Lamarca at home just in case I meet, I'm gonna do a blend of some kind or depending on the person's house where I'm doing a tasting, I'll bring it. Um, so going back to what Leslie said about Chandon. So Chandon is really interesting. It's Moet and Chandon and they are a house in Epernay. Beautiful house, miles and miles of caves. Um, just so much history. And um, they created with two families, Moet and Chandon, they married and um, created the business. Since in the last, I don't think it's been about 20 years, but they've been investing in other countries. And what they do is wherever they establish, they take those local grapes. So if you go, the one Leslie's drinking, that Chandon, is sparkling white wine made in the <clears throat> um, method Champenois, but the grapes are from, um, are from California. So when we were in Australia, I went to the Chandon where I got this glass, and the grapes were from Australia. And so though they're the same grapes, they're planted in different regions and they taste like that region. I can't say I love the ones in Champagne. I, I mean, in, in Australia, I really didn't. I love the Moet and Chandon in, um, in Epernay. And of course they own Dom's Perignon. Um, and we're walking through the, um, the caves there and someone said, have you passed any Dom? Hmm. And she said, you just passed hundreds of thousands of bottles of Dom, um, which is a high level champagne. It's usually vintage, meaning one year, one particular year that was fantastic, has to be blended 80% from that year. And they only do that every once in a while. It's called a vintage champagne. And those are the $100 wines, $150 wines, plus to thousands of dollars. Um, and the extraordinary years can go up like a Cristal, for example, thousands. Um, and so, um, and so um, the Chandon, um, it depends. So I like California Chandon. I didn't like Australian Chandon. And what I'm getting at is in China, they, are, they have built and established a Chandon there. So they'll be growing these grapes, these this Pinot uh, Noir, the Chardonnay, the, the Meunier in um, China. So if you go there, it's going to taste different, yeah, even though it's the, same, it's the same recipe. <laughs> right, Keith reminds me we're not going to China. Okay, so now. Now, Marla is, starting, is jumping in on pairings. It's really good with salmon. Salmon, lemon, butter, and lemon pepper. <clears throat> Brings out a flavor of apple. Yep. Okay, good. So there's a lot of dimensions in what Marla is describing that she's eating. And that's why there's so much texture in a sparkling wine that it can really, really bring out those different flavors. Um, and so Marla notes that the super sharp cheddar brings out a butter. And Greer also, hers was good with cheddar, but not with brie. So when something's not good with brie, brie coats your palate. And so it interferes in your taste sensations with, with the champagne. Does that mean that soft cheese is always bad with champagne? No, it will depend on the taste qualities, or I'm sorry, and sparkling wines. Um, Prosecco, I would be curious, Greer, how brie is with Prosecco. So Tracy doesn't like champagne, but she loves La Marca. Tracy, I would be curious to know if you like Chardonnay, okay? So there's a difference. There's peach and, and other um, fruit qualities in La Marca that you're not going to get in Champagne. And so those fruits will tell you what your flavor profile is. And says, love La Marca. Yeah, Costco sells at $11.99, that's right. Um, and it says China, right? 
Leslie says, Rick wasn't a champagne drinker when I met him and I got him a bottle of Dom to introduce him to it. Yes. And Dom is, <clears throat> if you start with a high level champagne when you are introduced to champagne and you taste it, really think about it and taste it, you will be amazed. So when we talk about price, price points, as um, it's out, um, the La Marca, $11.99, right? And in the New Hampshire liquor store, it's usually between 12 and 14. The Chandon will be about 14, $15. Marla, can you remind us how much your Burgundy, your Cremant was? Um, and <clears throat> Greer says the um, champagne is great with potato latkes. Yeah, it always amazes me with spicy food, how good it is as well. Yes, okay, so Tracy's response was no, she does not like Chardonnay. So Tracy, that tells you that pear profile, green apple, that's not for you. It's just not what you like. So if you tried a champagne that maybe was heavier on the Pinot Noir, you may like that. But if you like Prosecco, go for it. It's got a better price point than Chardonnay, certainly. And right now it's really expensive Chardonnay over. You can get a good bottle. I mean, not Chardonnay, champagne. You can get a good bottle of champagne for $40 plus. Um, but these other options that you guys have, have phoned in on your comments, the, um, the Cava, great choice, the Cremant, great choice, the Chandon, great choice, the Lamarco, Prosecco, great choice, all of these that you guys have all great choices. Um, <laughs> so Tina says eating macaroons with, um, with it, that, or are they macarons, Tina, with, you have to tell us, uh, French macarons um, with champagne interesting sweetness overload and that could be like the drier the champagne the more it can be in some, it can be it can go with <clears throat> sweetness um, some people will drink um, the sweeter champagnes just as a dessert with cheese um, with a nice cheese as well or sparkling wine um, <laughs> Greer is going to Leslie she's gonna try the Dom um, yes Mary, why, why would it be, oh, <laughs> I just got Mary's <laughs> the leftover sparkling wine. Mary says, will it be, that's, the point is moot. It might be moot. Um, and then Lisa said. going to say the same thing about the Easter comment. <laughs> yes, it will last. Mine will not last. So Marla got a bottle of Prosecco, and that's to make mimosas on Sunday. What else might you guys mix with this stuff? What would you mix with, with the Prosecco? Now, it's interesting. Tracy and I attended a, a bubbles night at 90 plus and 90 plus I did like the rosé they had a high level um, they had bought 90 plus again to remind you they bottle other people's wine and so they had a really beautiful um, it was something like la femme de la casse something like that and what they've done is gone to champagne and somebody had an extra batch and they bought it and they sold it and it did really really well I think the price point was 40 which means it was probably a 60 to 80 dollar bottle um, but they did not serve that at their bubbles party. They served their rosé. Um, I mean, they're always kind of a safe bet. Their Prosecco was really nice as well, as was their champagne. And they served it with oysters, which I love oysters and champagne, oysters and dry sparkling wine. Okay, so I do say champagne a lot because it's my favorite, but know that really <clears throat> overall dry sparkling wine is indicating that same kind of taste profile. So Lisa likes to mix pom that's fantastic. And then the palm seeds will float to the top and make a beautiful, beautiful um, display. And Anne does palm juice and pomegranate. Um, and Leslie does a little chambord. Yes, absolutely. Um, sometimes a little, little raspberries to float to the top with chambord is really beautiful. Okay. Um, so we're talking about taste qualities. And um, we're all tasting a little bit different um, profiles. But to give Tracy an idea when she's talking about, I like um, Prosecco over Champagne. So Chardonnay in Champagne will have white flowers. It will be apple, pear, green apple, um, ginger, mint, chalk. Ch that chalk is almost like a taste quality. Um, and um, anise. Um, and a little bit of white bread, that yeast, you definitely get white bread toast. The Mounier character is wild strawberry, apricot, mandarin, yellow, peach. And then the Pinot Noir gives it red fruits and oranges and apples and mangoes and black cherry and blueberry and violets. Tracy, that's why I think if you had more of a Pinot Noir style 
to your sparkling wine that's made in the traditional method, you would like it. Okay, so we're going to have to test that out sometime soon, Tracy. All right, so Leslie says fresh strawberries. And yes, fresh strawberries, um, just eating it with um, sparkling wine is, is fantastic. Um, and I have not eaten pomegranate seeds. I have not, I mean, I, I would put it in it, but I haven't eaten, um, you know, tried them tasting it with, although I guess I have had pomegranate juice, and that is really, really good. And you can do um, lots of different mixes with Prosecco. Um, and kava. So New Year's Eve, what do I serve? I serve some champagne at the beginning because I want my guests to be able to taste it. And in the end, when everybody is not sober anymore, I will serve either Chandon or I will serve a Prosecco. So that I switch to the less expensive bottles when um, once, you know, the end of the night. Um, so, um, unless I know that you really, really want good champagne, then I'll open it for you anytime. Okay. <laughs> I did want to tell you the pictures that I posted. So the post that I pinned um, first when I first announced this, that is a picture at, at, at Ruinart. And they have a lit up bottle to show you what it looks like when the leaves are um, riddled and they're at the top of the bottle. Okay. And then the other one, the posting for tonight, that is artwork. And that was really the first time that, and I knew I was misunderstanding, by the way. <laughs> Um, pomegranate juice and seeds in the Prosecco. I knew I was missaying it. Um, that artwork is one of the first pieces that um, they really saw, that historians saw, where they had champagne in the picture and people enjoying themselves with champagne around a meal. And from that recent history, right after that, they started, the French came up with, okay, food, wine, champagne, all goes together for a fine lifestyle. Um, and that's one of the, those pieces of history where it just took off to really indicate um, fine, elegant living. Okay. Um, so I'd be curious to see um, afterwards, and Leslie gives a tip, put them in the glass and they will soak it up and then you eat them. Yes, that sounds incredible. Um, and I'm curious to see if you can all taste your, your um, sparkling wine again and see how many bubbles are lasting if you don't have to pour again. So if you keep this in the middle pouring, <laughs> that's okay. Enjoy your bubbles. But if you're, my glass has been open. I have the same glass since I started because I was doing a lot of talking. And you can see I still have a little bit of bubbles. Maybe you can't see. I have a little bit of bubbles left. It's pretty flat, just a little bit of effervescence. And it tastes like a white wine. All right. Um, any other? questions let me know you can always reach out to me thank you as always for joining us Lisa says good residual bubbles that's right um, thank you for joining us tonight um, it was a crazy day and I'm so thankful that I have all of you that I could share this time with and hopefully um, it was some time for you to relax and enjoy your evening and enjoy your bubbles and anytime you want to enjoy a bottle of bubbles with me let me know I'd love to and um, as Melissa's commenting, same glass, she still has the bubbles. They've continued, the CO2 has continued on. Um, so take care, everybody. Be safe, and we'll see you next Friday. Take care.